Okay, so let me also th start by thanking the organizers for this very nice meeting. So I was, I gave some other title. I was to think of as a deadline to get something done, but that didn't happen. So I'm talking about something old. I'll also apologize because many people have heard this talk and one person has heard it and almost mentioned a number of times. So, uh, so I'll talk about cell polarity in uh, C. elegans uh, zygotes. This work is actually done in collaboration with uh, Peter Gross, uh, Frank Elisher, and Stefan Gill, all of whom are in uh, Dresden, Max Planck uh, Institute. So the idea is the following. So there is this creature called uh, C. elegans, and uh, what we are doing is to look at the development of this creature. And it turns out that this creature starts out by a single cell, which is enclosed in a, a, sim, a simple egg shell, if you can just see the outline here. And you look at the very first cell division that happens, starting from a single cell zygote to a multiple cell organism. The very first cell division turns out it's asymmetric, in the sense that you can really make out the size is different for the two cells. So the two daughter cells are not of the same type. Now, concomitant with this division, if you actually follow certain chemicals, you see that not only there's a asymmetry in the shape of the cells, but there's also an asymmetry in the way certain chemicals get distributed. So this is the way in which the cell knows which one to be big and which one to be small and so on. So, so, uh, so this is polarity uh, in a way by sorting out certain chemicals to the left half or the right half, polarity being established in the bulk of the cell, the 3D uh, bulk of the cell. At the same time, if you actually look at the surface of the cell, so there's this thin atomizing meshwork called the atomizing cortex, and you're looking at the bottom half doing the confocal image, and myosin is labeled. You see uh, flows happening on the surface of the cell. These are cortical flows. So myosin, if you watch the movie for some time, you'll see that there's a consistent flow of myosin from the right to the left side of the movie. So at the same time, uh, certain other chemicals, if you look at the midplane, uh, establish a certain polarity pattern. So you start out by seeing something which is completely red on the surface of the cell, and then suddenly a blue patch comes up, and then finally a domain gets established. So this is polarity which is happening on the surface of the cell. And if we actually watching uh, the movies and looking at the time dynamics, you can, uh, we actually know that this is what dictates that. So this is the one that establishes first, which gives rise to the polar polarity in the bulk. And so that gives rise to the cell division. So what I'm really interested in is trying to understand this. Uh, there are actually two different proteins uh, called part two and part six. So there's a complete exome with the cytosol, I'll come to that. So this problem is called par polarity, par for partitioning defective protein. So you can just think of them as two chemicals, red and blue. And uh, the one very crucial element of this uh, in the developmental biology context is that it really establishes the anterior posterior, the head tail axis. So that's how the worm knows which side is head and which is the tail. And so this is also something which induces the asymmetric cell division. So I'll just spend a few minutes on trying to tell you the par phenomenology. The first thing is that there are two parts to the story. So one is there's the actomyosin cortex and there's the hydrodynamics of that. And then there is the polarity pattern which is getting established. So we want to understand them one by one. So let's go one by one stage by So one thing is that the cortex, as we all know, is a thin film of actin and myosin filaments just beneath the plasma membrane. And it's always in a continuous state of uh, uh, turnover. That means uh, the meshwork forms, reforms, deforms. There's motor proteins which are continuously exchanged with the bulk of the cell. And the motor proteins, the job is that they actually sit on the filaments and they consume ATP, which is the biological fuel, and they move. And so when they move around, they actually pull the filaments across. So that's how we generate mechanical forces in cell biology. So that's the fundamental way to generate mechanics, uh, mechanical forces in cells and tissue. So that's about the cortex. The power proteins on the hand, the red and blue proteins. So there is some fraction which is bound on the membrane. So there's some attachment with the membrane proteins, membrane lipids, sorry. And, uh, but there's some other fraction which is in the bulk of the cell. And so there is some exchange between the bulk and the uh, surface. And on the ones they are bound on the uh, surface, they can also diffuse on the surface and they can move along with the surface channel. Okay, so let's see one by one. So we want to understand, so there are flows and let's try to understand the flows as soon as possible. So first thing is uh, what was done uh, uh, in Stefan Grill's group uh, several years ago was the following. So you can actually look at these flows and you can uh, segment uh, uh, the images that you get. And over an average over a certain period of time, you can look at the profile of myosin, for example. I said myosin is the one that generates uh, forces. So first you can look at the profile of myosin. So there's some experimental profile of myosin there. At the same time, what you can do is to do particle imaging velocimetry, which is a way of looking at cross-correlation between successive frames and getting out the velocity field. And so you can do a particle imaging velocimetry, get a 2D velocity field, segment it properly, and then you also see a concomitant flow. So there's a clear flow from the right to the left. And you also see a distribution of myosin. So we want to understand why are the flows there? Where are the flows coming from? So a simple picture is the following. Now, if you have an actomyosin system, there are motor proteins walking on filaments, they tuck the filaments across, right? So if you have a patch of actin and myosin, 
uh, this on the average will want to contract over time, right? Okay. So let's say you have another patch, but with a higher density of motor protein. So obviously there'll be a higher force acting on the patch. So that will want to contract with a higher uh, velocity or it will take a shorter time to contract. So the key idea is the following. So this is a really a connected uh, segment. That means you have a gradient in the motor density. So then it's very easy to see that this is what will give rise to flow, right? So if you have atomizing contractility and you have a gradient in the atomizing contractility, that's how you generate hydrodynamic flow. So just try to make, to make that more quantitative. What you can do is to write down a simple hydrodynamic theory where you look at a thin film hydrodynamics of the cortex and on time scales larger than the turnover time, it turns out that you can think of the cortex as a thin film uh, fluid. And so you write down simple uh, force balance equations on the uh, cortex element. So if you think of the 1D uh, stress tensor, it has some viscous part, which is the usual one. Plus there is something which comes from the atomizing contractility, the activity of the motor. Now you write down a force balance, you just balance all the forces with some external forces. The external forces in the lowest approximation, you can think of it like a traction force acting on the thin film. So you get a flow equation with a certain length scale. Now you remember if we had a myosin here, uh, this is what we was measured experimentally, and this is the flow, we both were measured experimentally. So now we have the same statement that if you have a contractility, which is obviously proportional to the myosin activity, the gradient in the contractility is the source for the flow. It's the same thing we got the last time picture. But now we have a quantitative equation where we can actually, if you can model the contractility as relating to myosin, you should be able to predict the flow. And that's what was done. So if you assume the contractility is directly proportional to myosin, and put it back in here, because you know myosin, so you can predict the flow. So, or you can look at something which is saturating form, it doesn't make a much of a difference. So, take home message is myosin gradients drive flows. All right. So, let's get back to the power polarity problem that we really were looking at. So, the take home here is that you have myosin gradients, and this is what is generating the flows, and we know the active hydrodynamics of that quantitatively. So, let's get back to the parse now. What's the parse story? So, it turns out that whenever you say par proteins, you shouldn't think of this worm and this one cell division and so on and so forth. Par proteins are much more general. If you think of any cell in your body which is polarized, it's one of the parts or the homologs of the parts which is responsible for cell polarity. So it's a very general problem to think about. But this is a case for the, at least for the case of the C. elegans zygote, where the egg is very large and we can actually image things and do very quantitative stuff. Okay, so what do we know about the parts? So we know the following. So the parts have some structure and they have some structure which sort of gives them some binding domains to the lipids and so on and so forth. Let's not go into the details. But what's essential for the physics story here is that there are uh, so each one of these red or blue guys is actually a complex of three proteins. These individual proteins in the complexes have interactions with the other proteins in the other complex. And the take home is that the complex A and the complex P have mutually antagonistic interactions. They don't like to be together. So if there's A, it likes to kick off P, and if there's P, it likes to kick off A. So remember, I'm all I'm talking about is the surface concentration. When I say it kicks off, it kicks off into the bulk. So what this antagonistic interaction does is to sort of give you bistability. So remember, this is the picture we saw. We started from a situation which was uh, homogeneous and uniform in red, and we went into a state which is as a domain state in the red and the blue. So what you really need is therefore a bistability. So this is the bistability I'm talking about. This state is stable and that state is stable. So therefore, there should be something which takes you from that state to that state. So that's the trigger. So that's the natural question. So what is the trigger? Okay, so we'll come back to the trigger, but to just to take the par, uh, so the take home is that there are two proteins that have mutual antagonism between each other that leads to bistability. The proteins can exchange with the bulk, they can diffuse in the bulk. So the coupling is where the full story comes in, where's the coupling between the flow part and the patterning part. So if you actually look at the sequence of uh, events that comes up in the, in the, in the case of the uh, fertilization of the egg, the very first cell division, that's when you come to know the coupling here. So the sequence of events is the following. So there's the egg inside the mother, uh, a fertilization event happens. And uh, so about 30 minutes after fertilization, one of the centrosomes, which is some sort of a protein associated with the nuclear structure, we don't need to bother about that. So it turns out that the centrosome comes somewhere close to one of the poles of the ellipse, approximately, and that sort of kicks off the patterning process. So you see, as soon as the centrosome comes here, you see a green domain forming here. So the green domain forms, and that pushes the red domain backward. And then finally, about 55 minutes down the line, you have established a red domain and a green domain, and then you do cell division. So concomitantly, you'll see the two proteins which I showed in the very first movie. So there is a separation of the blue protein and the uh, dark blue dots to the right side, right? So this is what is the process that's happening here. So the trigger is the one that is really pushing the state from a homogeneous state into a pattern state. That's, so that's the trigger I was talking about. So there is the trigger, which is the centrosome, and that coupled with the mutual antagonism gives rise to the bistability is what kicks it from this state to that state. 
It turns out that what is the trigger in terms of the actual molecules and, and the actual uh, biochemical process. It turns out there are two pathways to do that. So one pathway is the following. So one pathway is that uh, there are certain other motor proteins called, uh, proteins called microtubules which are associated with this guy. And they actually take one of the molecule, which is P, and they just put it from the bulk onto the surface. So once you put something from the bulk onto the surface, remember there's a mutual antagonism, so that will automatically kick off the red guy. So you have this situation, you take P from here and put it there, so that will create a domain of the P, and so that will push things off. So there is some uh, good experimental evidence for that. The other pathway is what is the more physics-y way, and something that we are very keen on, is the following. So this, again, the same Q, the centrosome, uh, comes close to the pole and actually depletes myosin there. The exact chemical interactions are not necessary, one doesn't know, but uh, as far as our modeling is concerned, it's not even necessary. So it depletes the myosin there, and so that immediately should kick off a sort of idea in the picture. You have created uh, a profile of myosin, so which means a profile of myosin gives us a gradient of the active stress, so which means flow, and the flow will transport the protein. So that's how you transport the system from here. You create a myosin dip, generates flows on the surface, the flows will push off the pathway. Okay. So that's a lot of uh, storytelling, right? So let's actually get down to the physics now. So first to do that, we need to get very good quantitative data. Otherwise, it's just hand waving, goes left, goes right, and all. Uh, so to do that, this is something which my colleague Peter Gross did very extensively over several years. It's the following. So we can actually look at these uh, movies, and we can actually go into the same plane for both of them in the mid plane. And we can actually start looking at these images very, very quantitatively and do the following. So we look at this uh, um, uh, egg, the eggshell, and uh, we look at the images, we segment them, uh, cut it out, look at it as a 1D thing. So we have actual number, numerical profiles for the concentration fields of the R protein. So we can do that over several embryos, average it, synchronize it in space and time, and then calibrate it with respect to some known concentration. So we have actual uh, molecules per micrometer square. And uh, so finally, we get concentration profiles. So this is space, and this is time. So this is red and blue superimposed on one another. So we can do the same thing for myosin. So we can get the other one, which is the motor protein. At the same time, for each myosin movie, like I said, we can do a particle imaging velocimetry, and so we can get the flow, right? So you have all four fields at the same time, the myosin and the flow, the red field and the blue field. So if you actually look at the experimental data, that's how it looks like. So you really see a profile of uh, myosin to begin with at the start, you will see a dip when the movie loops. You'll see a dip in myosin that creates a flow profile. That flow profile will push off the paths onto the left and the right. Okay. So that's how we, uh, that's how quantitatively we can get the data. All right. So I just have two minutes and I want to quickly. Okay. So I'll just keep this. I don't need And I don't need this. Yeah. So let's try to build a theory for this system. So the theory is the following. So so we have the two proteins, anterior and posterior parts, A and P. So they have some surface bound fraction and there's some bulk fraction. So obviously there's going to be exchange between the two. So that's some weights that are going to be there. And they can move around on the surface. So the movement can happen either by diffusion or it can happen because there is flow in the cortex, which is taking along the proteins. So when the proteins meet each other, either by diffusion or by advection, we know there's a mutual antagonism and so they get kicked off into the cytosol. The third layer is myosin. So myosin also has some simple exchange kinetics with the bulk. And at the same time, we found experimentally that myosin, uh, one of the proteins likes to kick off myosin and the other one likes to recruit myosin. But at the same time, myosin via active hydrodynamics generates advection. And the advection is what really transports all the three part proteins, right? So the final thing that you need is the Q. So the trigger is the one that really, this is the one pathway I said, one loads the P protein directly onto the surface or the other pathway which it depletes myosin onto the surface. So this is the model for the biologist. For this audience, I should write this. Okay. And we try to sort of go back and forth between what we did there. So we write down reaction diffusion advection equations for the three components, actin, sorry, uh, anterior part, posterior part, and myosin. So there's the advection term, diffusion term, and chemical reactions. Chemical reactions include simple on-off kinetics, uh, mutual antagonism between the part proteins, some interaction between the part and the myosin, and the two triggers that we said, the two pathways that we said. And as usual, there's the hydrodynamic flow between the Thing that couples. Okay, so we can look at the phase diagram of the parts, and she's already up, so I'll skip that part. Uh, so what we can do is the following. So this is the data, and for some set of nice parameters, we can actually get a theoretical curve, which look very much like the data. So it might be good to just sort of uh, say, okay, we have reproduced more or less what looks like this. So we were a little courageous and asked, uh, can you fit the theory with the data? Now obviously, we'll see, oh my God, there's a huge hell of a number of parameters, and obviously you can fit anything you want. So we should all remember this quote, right? So 
you can fit an elephant if you have more than five parameters and we have more than 20 parameters. So, and there's a nice proof of that, you can urge you to look it up. Um, so I should really tell you how many parameters are free and how many can we actually measure in the experiment. So it turns out that we can measure all the parameters which have been marked in green and we really have only about one, two, three, four, five parameters free in the whole theory. So we know actual numbers for each one of them and every and error bars on all each one of them. Okay, I can still fit an elephant, there are five parameters. So, so you go back to the theory, but then you have, you have this idea that there are two pathways. I'll just take one more minute. There are two pathways and we can selectively knock out one of the pathway or the other. So what you can do is to do, do some protein perturbation and knock off the flow pathway and that in terms of the equation knocks off the flow and the myosin part of the story. So there's only a reaction diffusion chemistry and we have data for that and that's the fit between the theory and the data. So this is data obtained from living organisms and average of space and time and it looks pretty good. All right. Okay, so once you do that, you actually fit, fix these two parameters, right? Okay, that's good. So now let's go back to the other one and we can knock off this pathway. And that in some, some theory terms, it knocks off just one term. And I can do the fits now. But this time I have four fields and I can fit all of them reasonably well. And uh, so that's good. It turns out that therefore I can fix two more parameters. So now we go to the full case where there are both of them, that's a wild type. And you realize there's no more free parameters left. And you wonder whether it works. And we just put it in there and it seems to work reasonably well. Okay, uh, so that's, the, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So there was one thing, one more thing about predicting the threshold, I'll, I'll probably skip that. Okay, okay. So, I, so I just want to conclude by saying that there's a nice system where we can actually get very quantitative data and very quantitative comparisons between theory and experiment can be done. Thanks Vijay for that energetic talk. Maybe I'll allow one quick question. While the speaker comes down, the next speaker comes. One quick question. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Why are they? No, 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 no. He can go for the flow. The flow will direct everything that's there. They also move. You've seen that. The actin also moves. Uh, there's, some, there's some other biology company. 